Hi, welcome to the Iowa State Geometric Analysis Seminar. Today, our speaker is Jin Rei Chen, who is an assistant professor at Stony Brook University. He completed his PhD at University of Wisconsin Madison in 2018. He originally studied semi geostrophic equations before doing some very interesting work in Kähler geometry. Today, he'll be talking about analytical aspects for the existence of constant scalar curvature or Kähler metrics. Okay. Um... Thanks for inviting me, and it's a good pleasure to speak at um, Alva State, even if it's um, where I'm not able to come in person. Okay, so um, so I would like to start with the uniformization theorem, which says that a Riemann surface has a Riemannian metric of constant curvature, and um, our theorem can be viewed as a generalization of this theorem to higher dimensions, and um, so that we are looking for. Um, constant scalar curvature metric on complex manifolds. Um, and we will consider more, more specifically the case of compact Kähler. Okay, so let me start with the definition of what, is a, what a Kähler manifold is. So you have a compact complex manifold of dimension n, and we say that is a Kähler manifold if there is a real 1 1 form, omega 0, such that it is positive and is closed. So um, uh, we know that omega zero defines remand metric on omega zero, so that and you can write this omega zero in local coordinates c one up to z n, where you can write omega zero to be the g i j bar d z i by g z j bar, where the g i j bar is point wise positive permission, and so that you have these uh, two equalities, which just means that, uh, um, well, which just means that uh, the form is closed. Okay, so let's. Move on to the Kabi's program. So um, Kabi, in the 80s of last century, he proposed the program finding a canonical representation of the Kähler matrix in a given class. And he proposed to minimize the following um, L2 functional by taking the, the, the L2 norm of the scalar curvature. Uh, so he so you fix some class omega zero, the, the cohomology class omega zero, and uh, you choose a metric in that class. Um, and then you take the scalar curvature of that metric, and then you take the L2 integral of the scalar metric, scalar curvature with respect to the volume defined by that metric. Okay, so that defines the Calabi, Calabi energy. And uh, he proposes to, uh, he proposes to um, look for the critical points of such Calabi energy. And the critical points of this functional are called extremal metrics. And uh, of course, um, when you study the such variational problem, the first thing you need to do is to write down the Euler-Lagrange equation. And it turns out the Euler-Lagrange equation takes the following form. So the, it, the equation says that this vector field, um, which is like the holomorphic part of the gradient of the scalar curvature, is a holomorphic vector field. That's a condition for the metric omega to be a critical point of this critical point of this um, kind of energy. So, and we will, what we'll be studying is a kind of a spatial case of the extremal metrics. So in other words, we'll just focus on the case where the scalar curvature is a constant so that this vector field X is equal to zero. Okay, so this is the situation we'll be studying. Um, okay, so that just means that your scalar curvature is equal to the average of the scalar curvature. And you can show that the average of the scalar curvature is just equal to, is just, is a, is a constant which depends only on the class and not on the choice of the metric in the class. Okay, so as you, and also um, you notice that when for a generic um, killer manifold where the manifold M doesn't have any non-trivial holomorphic vector field so that you automat automatically have X equal to zero. In that case, um, any extreme metric must be CSTK because you must have a R of omega must be a constant. So that in terms of uh, increasing generality, you have uh, Kiel Einstein metrics is containing CSTK metrics and is containing extreme metrics. Okay. Uh, next, the next thing we'll do is to kind of rewrite the CSTK equation um, so that it is more convenient to handle from analysis point of view. Okay, one convenient thing about working in the killer setting is that it is possible to use the DD bar lemma 
to represent an arbitrary class, arbitrary, met, arbitrary metric in that class in terms of a nice, known, good background, smooth background metric, omega zero. So here, omega zero is just some smooth reference background Taylor metric you choose. And in terms of that, you can represent an unknown metric in that class in terms of a kilo potential phi, which is a real valid function defined on M in terms of the complex hessian of that potential function. So that in local coordinates, your unknown metric omega is written as gij bar plus phi ij bar. Okay, so that, um, going, so that um, the space of kilo potentials is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the killer metrics in, the, in that class. Mod, after you module out ending a constant. Okay, so then, the, okay, so then we will move on to kind of motivate the, the exist, let, let's we'll move on to the existing part of the CSC metric. Now it is known that you don't, you cannot always solve the CSC equation on manifold because it is known there are examples. I think the earliest goes back to Levine, which construct who constructed a manifold so that um, every class there's, there exists no extreme metric. So it is known that such metrics do not always exist. Then the question is when do they exist? And uh, their existence is conjectured to be like equivalent to some stability condition from for the manifold, and that is that stability condition is defined using the language of algebraic geometry. And um, so that's the famous Yalta and Donaldson conjecture, but for now we will not go to algebraic geometry. We will just focus on the existence question from the analytical point of view. Okay, so next thing we would, since our goal is to, um, to um, do estimates for the CSC equation, our next goal is to rewrite this equation in terms of the potential function phi, because we just said any metric in that class can be represented in terms of a potential function phi. So that potential function phi becomes the unknown function we need to establish estimates for. Okay, so, okay, so, so that let's say uh, we have a unknown potential function phi so that we represent omega phi as omega zero plus the complex hessian of some potential function. And then we can express the CSK equation using local coordinates where the local coordinates just reads as follows. So the left-hand side is really just the expression of a scalar curvature using local coordinates. And you want that scalar curvature to be equals to a constant. So this is our equation we need to work with. And you can observe that this equation is a fourth order elite equation in terms of the potential function, phi. Okay. Um, well, for fourth order equation, um, the first thing is that there's no maximum principle, but what helps us is that it is possible to write this fourth order equation as a pair of second order equation coupled together so that we are able to use the maximum principle individually to each of them and then we can get estimates. So the way to do this is to, let's say we introduce the, the volume ratio to be e to the f to be the, the ratio of the volume form of the, unknown metric over the background metric. So that you can rewrite this above equation as in the following way. So you just kind of use, you add and you subtract and add back. So that you do, you can write your equation this way. And you see that this inside the first bracket, um, this is your F, sorry. The inside the first bracket, this is just your F. So that um, your, Original CSK equation is written into a pair of uh, second order coupled equations where the first one is just the complex non jump equation. And the second equation is just a linear function of the logarithm of the volume ratio. But the coefficients of that linear function depends on the, depends on the unknown function phi. So you really cannot just apply any, any, any linear estimate yet because you don't have the Laplacian phi to be uniformly lifted. So, okay, so the, then next, let me just explain what are the main estimates we get about the CSC equation. 
and here the theorem is for uh, is for a more general is for a CSK equation in a more general form where we allow the right hand side to be a bounded function plus the trace of a bounded one real one on form. And so that, and where you can, of course, normalize so that soup of the potential be zero, because of course, you see that if you n phi, if you n a constant to phi, it doesn't change the equation. Okay, so that we normalize that soup equal to zero, so that then estimate goes as follows. So depending on such quantities, you can estimate the W4P normal the potential function by a constant C, where the constant C depends on the following quantities. It will depend on the background metric, depends on the P, and also the, the depends also on the C0 bound of the right-hand side, basically. And the unusual thing is that you, it will involve an upper bound of the entropy, defined as follows. You see that, okay, so this is the definition of the entropy. You see that without a log factor, this is just the volume. So the extra thing is just this uh, log factor. And the, app, and the dependence, on this upper bound of entropy is necessary because, um, because we know that the CSCK equation is not, not always solvable on a, on a compact header. So, well, if the CSC doesn't exist, you can expect that if you try to solve the CSC equation by using a continuity method, you can expect that the upper bound of entropy must blow up because all the rest of the quantities must be preserved along the continuity path. So the entropy bound is what will blow up near the, along the continuity path. Once you have control over the entropy bound, then you can estimate the potential function phi up to W4P. And then if you, if you have like higher regularity of R and eta, then you can kind of bootstrap using standard estimates to get arbitrary, arbitrary high derivative bounds for the potential function so that your continuity path can continue. Okay, so that is the main estimate we will use to prove the existence. Okay, and the next, as I said, um, the, you don't always have existence. So you must need to impose some conditions to guarantee existence. And now let me just motivate that condition. Okay, so, and this, and the motivation of that theorem of the existence condition goes back to a geometric feature, which goes back to, Mabuchi, Sands, and Donaldson, where they kind of just think of all the Kähler potentials in that in a given class and view that class, sorry, and view that view the set of Kähler potentials as an infinite dimensional Riemannian manifold. So, um, so that okay, so you consider the class of all um, Kähler potentials in that class omega zero, and uh, given. Uh, Kilo potential, you can define a volume form that defines volume form, and you can use that to define a Riemannian metric on H, where you, for any pair of tangent vectors um, for H at phi, where, okay, so you can see that um, the tangent vectors are just C infinity functions on M, where you define the, the inner product to be the L2 inner product using the volume form defined by omega phi. Okay, so this, you can verify that this indeed defines a Riemannian metric on H. And this H is a non-positive curved space. You can show that this uh, edge has non-positive scalar, has non-positive uh, sectional curvature. Okay, so uh, it, it's a non-positive curve. Okay, so there are a lot of things you can do once you, once you are equipped with this Riemannian metric. You can calculate the geodesic equation, which can be found to take this form. Um, this form is not particularly convenient to work with. And uh, if you complexify the time variable of the geodesic, of the geodesic, then you can show that this complexified function will solve a homogeneous complex Monge-Alpha equation, which basically says that determinant of the complex Hessian equal to zero. Okay, so, and this Riemannian metric also defines a distance function on the on the space of Kilo potentials edge. And uh, where you just take the usual, the familiar form formula uh, of how you define the distance on a, on a manifold. So that you just minimize the, the length of the curves connecting two points. And uh, 
for the start of statistical metrics, you, you, it's very convenient to consider the so-called energy, K energy, where the K energy is defined in terms of the variation by, uh, in terms of this formula, so that you immediately see that the critical points of the K energy are exactly CSK metrics. And uh, it is convenient to kind of, you want an explicit formula for K energy, and then you can integrate this uh, variational formula along, uh, along any smooth path to get us explicit formula. And you can find that the K energy has, takes, has this explicit formula where it is written as the entropy part plus a J term. Okay, so, okay, so you have this explicit formula K energy and later on along the continuity path to always show that this K energy is always bounded from above. But we actually need to get estimate is that we actually want is the entropy is bounded from above. So, so here's the difference. We always have along the continuity path that this K energy is always bounded from above, but we really need this entropy to be bounded from above in order for the estimate to work. So the whole, I mean, the whole point is how do you get that, how do you get the K energy bound, how do you get the entropy bound from the K energy bound? And that's the key point. Okay, so, um, okay, so why is this K energy um, helpful to us? Okay, so, uh, the, it is shown by Berman and Brinson. They proved that the energy is convex along um, smooth. Well, it is kind of um, formal that this you can take if you have if you have a smooth geostatic. That is, if you have a smooth solution to this, then you can verify that the energy will be smooth along geodesics. But usually, you don't have smooth geodesics, unfortunately. But nevertheless, you have uh, you can prove that Berman. You can prove that the energy is convex along even non-smooth geodesics in the space edge. So that statistical metrics are not just critical points, but also minimizers of the K energy. Okay, and that motivates the so-called properties conjecture, which says that you have existence of CSK metrics if and only if your K energy has, your K energy has linear growth as the distance goes to infinity. So that's basically what the second condition says. Your, the second condition basically says that your K energy controls the D1 distance in a linear way as the distance goes to infinity. And this picture is very, uh, is is very intuitive and consistent with the, the, the geometric intuition because you can think of a convex function divided on Rn. Now the question is when does this convex function Rn has a, minim has a minimum? And you can see that this convex function has a minimum if and only if this convex function grows at least linearly as x contends to infinity. So that's what the, that's the geometric intuition behind the conjecture. And of course, there's a subtle point about this D1. Okay, so the, the previous distance we defined use, using the remaining metric is actually D2 distance. And the D1 distance is really just you, you take the L1 norm instead of L2 norm here for the tangent vector. So D1 distance will just you are taking instead of L2 norm. Instead of taking L2 norm, you have to take the L1 norm of the tangent vector. Okay. And then so that is uh, so and the uh, and the uh, one direction is from the existence to the properness uh, is done by Berman and Davas Lu, where they prove that the Existence of CSK metrics implies the kind of the linear growth as the distance tends to infinity in terms of the D1 distance. Um, okay, so, and of course, their work also shows that the D1 distance is the correct distance to, to consider. And our work, it concerns the, the, the converse direction, the reverse direction, where you want to show that you want to show the existence if you assume such a properness condition. Okay, so. The way we prove existence of CSK matrix is by doing a continuity method where you consider the following continuity path. And you see that um, as t equals one, this gives the CSK equation one to solve. And uh, t equal to one, t equal to zero, you get 
trace omega phi omega zero minus n equal to zero. So we basically have to prove the formula about this continuity path. So you have to prove three things when you run a continuity method. You have to be able to make sure that you can solve the equation with t equal to zero. And you want to show that the set of solvable t is open. And you also need to show that the set of solvable t is also closed. So we'll look at them one by one. Okay, so the first thing is to want, you want to make sure that you can solve the equation with t equal to zero. And you see that if you put t equal to zero, you get trace omega phi among zero minus n equal to zero. And for that, we have a trivial solution because we could just take phi to be zero. Okay, so then the next thing you have to, so the equation, so the condition one is easy. So the next thing is you have to make sure that you can, the set of solvable t is open. So the usual way to prove openness is by doing implicit function theorem, where you have to linearize the equation and you want to make sure that the linearized operator is invertible. And that's indeed the case. And it's proved by, uh, by trend by for t between zero and one. And you have to run uh, implicit function theorem. Uh, and you see, and there's uh, some subtlety about the openness and t equal to zero, because you see that when t is positive, strictly positive, you have a fourth order equation, whereas if t equal to zero, you have a second order equation. So you are kind of deforming a second order equation into a fourth order equation so that the openness doesn't really um, directly follow. So instead you have to kind of run the iteration in a careful way to make sure that you can uh, solve the, the you can solve the equation for small t. And this is done independent by Zen and Hashimoto. Um, so this is step is a little bit subtle and difficult. So the only thing that remains is to prove closeness. In other words, um, you let Ti increases to T star and you have, uh, you are assumed that Bi is the solution with T equals to Ti, you have to be able to take the limit. Okay. So uh, the, the next thing I would like to explain is that how we you can use the main estimate to show the path is closed. Okay. So um, the reason we are using this form of continuity path is that uh, the solution, so, so this, the reason is that for n t between zero and one, the solution to this will minimize a version of so-called twisted k energy, where the twisted k energy, you are just taking the linear interpolation between k energy and the j omega zero functional defined as follows. And this j omega zero functional is also convex along a geodesic. And uh, so that since both k and j omega zero are convex along geodesics. So there will be their linear interpolation will also be convex along geodesics. So that any solution to the continued path will automatically be the minimizer of this um, twisted energy. So that in particular, this twi twisted energy is bounded from above along the continued path. Okay. So you have uh, this twisted energy is bounded from above. And the other thing is that this j omega zero is bounded from below because uh, you see that if you take phi to be zero, you get a good critical point. But this is this j thing is convex, so that this j omega zero is bounded from below. But the whole thing is bounded from above, so that the k energy is bounded from above. So this is what I basically explained that this k energy must be bounded from above. Now is the place. Now is the place to use the properties assumption. So now let's go back to see what the properties assumption says. The properties assumption basically says that the k energy controls the d1 distance. So that since we have shown that the k energy is bounded from above along the continued path, you see that the d1 distance also is bounded from above. That that's what the properties assumption gives us. Okay, so. Um, so, okay, so you have this uh, k energy is uniformly bounded from above and also know that D1 distance is bounded from above. And also you can show by kind of elementary calculation that this J part involving the risk of the background metric is controlled by the D1 distance. So that, um, so that, but D1 distance is bounded as well. So that the J part is uniformly bounded but the energy is bounded from above so that you get a uniform upper bound of entropy. 
And then that's exactly what we need for the estimate to go through. So let's just go back to the main estimates. So here's the main estimate. So that other than the usual dependence, you can you can you can expect, and then only non-usual dependence is that is a dependence on the upper bound of entropy defined as follows, and that's exactly required in order for the estimate to go through. So and then and then we just see that the primary assumption exactly gives what we wanted, so that we can um, get that uniform W four p bound for any finite p, but then you can kind of bootstrap and use standard elite estimates to get higher order bounds. Okay, so that's how the, um, that's how the probability assumption helps us to uh, show the path is closed. Okay, so the next thing is that I would like to explain um, how do you establish the main estimates. So we need, let's just go back to the equation itself. The CSK equation itself. Let me just explain how do I get estimate for the CSK equation itself because the estimates for the general form equation will really make no difference. So let's just go back to this equation. Um, so this is the equation we need to work with. Um, and our goal is to get like W4P bound for this um, equation for the function phi. And it will, you can observe that it would be enough you can, if you can just show that the the Laplace, the, well, the omega phi is bounded from, has a positive low and upper bound. So in other words, you want to show that gij bar plus phiij bar has a uniform low and upper bound. Um, if you know that, then the, then the first, well, if you know that the, the phi is uniform bound from above and below, then you can use, uh, um, well, you, well, then you can, you, if you go to the second equation, you see that, uh, you see that this F must be C alpha using the, using the uh, linear theory. And then once you know that F is C alpha and that phi, well, the, and you know that this uh, is uniform elliptic, then you can get phi C2 alpha by using Evans Kralov. And once you have phi C2 alpha, then you can kind of bootstrap and get all the higher order estimates and up to W4P. So that's not a problem. So the only thing, so only question that is interesting uh, at the moment is just to show that this um, GIJ bar plus VIJ bar has a positive low and upper bound. So in other words, we just need to show um, show the the this bound. Omega phi is controls omega zero from above and below. So, well, basically, if you are able to show this, it then guarantees both second order elliptic equations are uniform elliptic. Then you can get higher order estimates with no problem. Okay, so then how do we get to this estimate? So there are several steps to do so. Um, okay, so we define this uh, e to the f to be the ratio of the volume form. And um, the first step is to get the upper bound of the volume ratio. Uh, use this as kind of the most subtle step. You have to use the the mass concentration technique. Um, and the next step is to get a C0 bound of the potential function phi. And that's really just a, just an estimate which goes back to Collodi, which says that, uh, which is really just the estimate for the complex Munjampa equation, which says that if you have, um, say, um, omega phi to the n equals to e to the f, omega zero to the n, and if the right hand side uh, let's just go back to the complex mon jumper equation. Um, so you have this equation and we have the first step I said is to get the upper bound for F. Once you have this upper bound of F, then you have E to the F is bounded from, a, is bounded. So that, and, but then an estimate of Collodi gives that once the right hand side is in LP for some P bigger than one, you have that, um, Phi has C0 bound, but we have actually each F is just bounded. So that's more than enough. So that we have a C0 bound of the potential function phi. Um, okay, so once you have a C0 bound for the potential function phi, and then we can get the lower bound of F as follows. Um, so you basically calculate this quantity and the Laplacian phi F uses the equation and 
the Laplacian VF, we see that's equal to negative R lower bar plus trace file raised to omega zero. And Laplacian phi of phi just goes to the rest and minus trace phi omega zero. So that you get this. Okay, so the point of ending on C phi is to overcome the raised to omega zero because raised to omega zero doesn't have a sign and we have to choose C big enough to make this negative. So that with C chosen big enough, you have this. Uh, you, you have, uh, so like, so you can get the trace omega phi omega zero, and then you use the, so this quantity is really just the, the eigenvalue, the sum of one over lambda i, where the lambda i's are eigenvalues of the metric omega phi, of the matrix omega phi. And then use the arithmetic geometric inequality, and that is greater than the geometric mean of this, geometric mean of those marvel lambda i's. And that gives e to negative f of n. So you have this differential inequality, and you assume this f plus c phi has uh, achieves the minimum at point p on m, so that this left hand side is non negative. So it is zero, so you get a zero is less than equal to this, so that you get f has bound as lower bound there, but phi already has a c zero bound already, you get this lower f has a lower bound. So far we have the C0 bound for both function phi and f. And now it's place to get a second derivative estimate. And the calculation here is quite similar to Yao's estimate, but the difference is that um, when, you, when you try to kind of imitate Yao's calculation, his calculation will involve the Laplacian f, where that would be a trouble for us because the f has no regularity because the only thing we have proved about F so far is just that F has zero bound, but no regularity yet. So the Laplacian F is um, is a trouble, and we'll handle that by integration by parts, and so that you have to do an integral estimate, and that's the reason we are only able to get LP bound for this step instead of getting estimate up to L infinity as y'all did. So you have you can only get it you can iterate only finite many steps, and you can get L, such LP bound for any finite p. And our final goal is to get L infinity bound. And then for that, we have to calculate the Laplacian phi of this quantity. And then you have to derive a differential inequality for this. And you have to, okay, so once you have, once you have a, once you derive the inequality, differential inequality for this, you can run a nash moser iteration. And it's possible because you have, you have shown, uh, you have shown LP bound for the second derivative for arbitrary large P. And for, for nash moser iteration, you really don't need the elliptic coefficients to be uniformly elliptic. You just need the, you just need the lower and upper bound satisfies the LP condition with P large enough depending on the, on the dimension. So really, you really just need the LPN bound for the second derivative where PN is some large constant depending on the dimension because you have to make sure that the sublet embedding goes through. Okay. So uh, for the rest of the time, let me just explain what is the what is needed in order to get this estimate uh, upper bound for the volume ratio. Okay. So the key idea is to consider our auxiliary function psi, which solves that um, the uh, omega, so the, the right hand side is kind of some uh, coercive function of the of uh, of the e to the f of the original right hand side. So without the square root f square plus one, this is just the function. This is just the equation for the function of phi. But we are ending in a little bit, a little bit uh, something that is coercive in terms of the volume ratio of the right hand side. And you have you can solve this equation because of the Yau's theorem. Okay, so this constant a is try is is a constant which makes uh, both both sides compatible, and uh, that's the place where the entropy bound comes in because in order to define this constant a, you will be able you will need to integrate this right hand side, and that's really just the entropy. Okay, so so the entropy bound basically allows you to define this this auxiliary auxiliary function psi. With this function psi, then you can show that this f is bounded by just using a little bit of psi 
plus an arbitrary large constant C depends on an epsilon. Okay, so uh, let me explain how you can get this upper bound F using this lemma. Um, okay, so we have to use the, the existence of alpha invariant uh, uh, cater manifold. So uh, basically it says that the class of all pre subharmonic functions um, um, cater manifold in a given class has some exponential bound. And this alpha zero is some constant which depends on the class uh, and also the manifold itself. So that you have this exponential bound. Now you can you, now you go back to this lemma. Now this psi is also pretty subharmonic. What you do is to times lambda large enough to both sides. Lambda is some large constant you can choose as you desire. You times lambda to both sides and you choose epsilon small enough so that epsilon times lambda is less than the alpha zero. And then you raise both sides to the exponential and then you integrate. So that, so here uh, you times lambda to both sides and choose epsilon small enough so that this lambda epsilon is less than whatever constant is needed in order to have the exponential bound. And you integrate that exponential on both sides so that you get e to the lambda f, a bound for integral of e to the lambda f. So the lemma will give us that integral of e to lambda f is bounded, which just implies that if you just go to the psi equation, the integral bound of e to lambda f just says that this right-hand side is in, L, is in LP for any finite p, so that you can use the Claudius estimate again to get a C0 bound of psi. But then once you have a C0 bound of psi, then you have from the lemma that f is just bounded from above. So that's the estimate you we would need. Okay, so the, the whole point is how to prove this lemma. Okay, so um, okay, so so the idea is to calculate, you kind of derive a differential inequality. You want to uh, so your goal is to get upper bound for f plus epsilon psi minus c05. So you kind of you want to calculate this quantity. But let's see what is Laplace phi acting on psi. So Laplace phi psi is really just a use a arithmetic geometric inequality again. You see that this it controls this uh, the the Laplace phi psi controls something that is coercive in f that is crucial to us. So that you derive this differential inequality. And let's say if we assume that phi has a C0 bound. So okay, so you have this differential inequality in any case. And let's say we start with the additional assumption that phi has C0 bound so that we, can, we could try to run maximum principle on this. Okay, so let's say, let's assume that this function on the left-hand side in the bracket has maximum at point P somewhere on the manifold so that the left-hand side is non-positive and then gives the upper bound of F at that point P. So you have this at, at maximum at some point P. Then you have this uh, left-hand side is less than equal to zero at P, and then you get the upper bound of F there, but psi is non-positive. And phi, you assume it has a zero bound. So the whole thing would be, would have an upper bound at point P, so that you have an upper bound of that function everywhere. Okay, so that gives the, gives the lemma with the additional assumption that phi has zero bound, but in our setting, you don't really have any bound to start with other than the exponent, other than the, well, the entropy bound. So the way to really prove this is to have to use the Alexandrov maximum principle. And, and you use the fact that you have a, you also have an exponential bound also for the function phi. Yeah, so, and then, so that we have this, uh, so that in general, we have only have integral bound of phi and you have to use the Alexandrov theorem to get around this because we don't really have a Caesar bound of phi in reality. Okay, so that's how we get this upper bound for the volume ratio. So then the rest of the time, let me just take the time to explain what are the, the open questions. Um, well, the open questions would be like, uh, okay, so we prove that the properness would imply the existence, um, but the, in reality, the properness condition is very difficult to check. And you would like to replace that with some condition that's easier to check. So 
Uh, one interesting question is that if you, let's say you have a project in a projective case where you have a positive line bundle. So, and that the omega zero is given by the DD bar of, uh, well, yeah. So DD bar of this uh, emission metric on the line bundle. So, and then you can consider the space of Bergman potentials defined using the, the, the defined using the, by taking the, taking a basis of uh, H0, the, taking a basis of a section from L, M to L to the K. And it is known that this uh, HK will approximate H in CMP topology. And the uh, one net natural question is that if you just impose the probability assumption on the finite dimensional approximation of H, is it possible that you can get actually full properness so that, so that you can prove existence by assuming that this properness assumption holds only on finite dimensional approximation. But here, delta is some, I think is some constant, which is some, which is called the Donaldson for tagging variant, which has a geometric meaning. But um, you, in general, you have to subtract a constant C, which in general will blow up as, K, as the dimension goes to infinity. Now the question is that if you can show, if you can kind of bound the CK uniformly, then you can pass the limit and show that the full properness holds. But usually the CK will have to blow up. Okay, so the question is that if you just have such properties for finite dimensional approximations, can you get the full properness? So that's the problem. Um, another question is what about the parabolic case? So the parabolic case seems to be a lot harder. Um, okay, so the parabolic analog of the CSK equation is just dt phi equals the scalar curvature minus the constant. Or it is possible to also possible to consider the so-called pseudo Calabi flow, where you take the where the difference is you apply the Laplace inverse on the right hand side. Okay, so and the second equation looks a bit easier to handle because if you look at the Calabi flow, this is really this is honestly a uh, fourth order parabolic equation and then it's nonlinear. And the second one is pseudo Calabi flow, which in principle is second order because the scalar curvature depends on the derivatives of the phi up to fourth order, but they are taking the inverse Laplace. So in principle, the right hand side is only two derivatives on the potential function. Okay, so, and uh, as we, the, and the, you can, we can write, rewrite the both flow equations using the way we did to handle the CSCK equation as follows. So you, as before, you can define the volume ratio to be e to the f so that you introduce this extra function f so that the original, so that the flow equation itself is written into this way, whereas the pseudo copy flow is written into this way and have dt phi equals the logarithm of volume ratio plus extra term p. If there were no such term p, you see that's really just a Kaleresi flow. But with this additional p, that makes it that makes it more complicated because the p will solve uh, is obtained by inverting the Laplace on this, and this Laplace phi is of course is not known to be uniform elliptic, and that creates the creates the trouble with if you try to shoot kind of global existence and convergence and so on. Okay, so. Um, that's what I would like to um, talk about today. And uh, thanks for listening.